Okay, well, welcome everyone um, to the December meeting of the Massachusetts Archaeological Society's Northeast Gene Winter Chapter. Um, we are really excited today um, to have uh, Jordan uh, Lukes coming all the way from Florida for us. Um, Jordan is a principal investigator at Search Incorporated, and previously he has held positions at the New York State Museum and the American Museum of Natural History. And earlier this year, he did release his first book, An Archaeology of Ethnicity, Race, and Consumption in New York. And I am very excited to have uh, my copy hopefully coming soon so I can read that. <laughs> And everything. So, uh, Jordan, welcome. Yeah, thank you very much. I'm very excited to be here. I guess I'll uh, share the screen here and get started. If that's okay. Oh, and just so everyone does know, at the end, you can um, ask uh, questions via the chat function, and I'll relay them to. Uh, Jordan, since uh, you cannot unmute yourself. Great. All right, that should be on everybody's screen now. I hope. Yep. Great. So the goal of this talk is to kind of go over, as Lindsay mentioned, my I had a book come out earlier this year, and it's really about um, the limitations of archaeology uh, when it applies to ethnicity and how racialization and the uh, application of identity to groups by historical agents leaves material culture signatures um, for us to, to look at, but it, that isn't always as prevalent as, as you might assume it would be. And that is connected to an economic development uh, connection to the world market and uh, the available market basket of goods which is something that um, Chris Fennell at uh, the University of Illinois actually worked on in Virginia. Um, and I used a similar set of methodologies, even though I didn't know Chris was working on that. We kind of did it together um, and mine's more centered on New York uh, specifically um, as a frontier region. So, the goal is, of this discussion is to explore definitions of complex social structures that have a bearing on today's culture, discuss those events and systems that created and bounded those structures, and discuss the people those, stru those structures affected, the cyclical systems those people and structures created, and the legacy of the entire environment within and without of the archaeological community, so how it affects both um, people within the discipline and then how it should be understood by people outside of the discipline as well. Um, so in order to do that, we're gonna talk for a little bit about, um, I'm gonna give you a bunch of definitions on terms that you might be familiar with, um, but how they apply to archeology span or anthropology is a little bit more nuanced than how they're used in popular culture or in the press or um, you know, the general knowledge about those, those uh, terms. Uh, we're going to talk about agrarian revolution and economic shift, uh, really the economic development between the 16th and 20th centuries and how that informs material culture. Um, I'm going to cover a little bit about immigration and uh, the new world, really the kind of meat and potatoes of the historic populations that we're going to be discussing. Um, that lends itself into a conversation about cycles of r racialization, which is you know, an application of um, pressures against groups that wouldn't necessarily self-identify as those groups. And then how that all relates to limitations within archaeology about the term ethnicity or what we can consider a cultural group in the past when we have a very limited data set um, that isn't informed on an individual level for individual sites. So we'll start with a, a definition of identity. Identity is realized as a series of overlapping spheres of belonging and relationship, which change throughout time. At any moment, the number and type of ident identities that a single individual may ascribe to could be different than any other point in their life. So it's really important to understand that identity is uh, 
kind of a slice into someone's life at any certain point along all of the relationships or interactions they've ever had with all of the, the family that they've ever interacted with or uh, been close to or any of their um, you know, beliefs about themselves that's all wrapped up into identity and it's something that's self-ascribed and uh, it can't be uh, applied uh, to anyone or any, uh, in any situation. It, it always has to be uh, outward. Um, which brings us to ethnicity. Uh, ethnicity is a form of self-expression and it's informed by one's own understanding of feelings towards their relationship with themselves, with their family and with the outside world, which is uh, tied to identity, right? Um, and ethnicity is a personal identification that should not be assigned from an outside entity as it is wholly cultural in scope, definition and application. So an ethnic group um, would identify together as an ethnic group, but they can't be ascribed as an ethnic group from an outside uh, uh, pressure or an outside governing body or anything like that. Um, when they are, when a, when a group of individuals is kind of boxed in to a specific uh, grouping by an outside force, it's really a racialization process which is happening. Um, and that's the application of an identity to a person or group of people who have not identified as a communal ethnic identity and is usually accompanied by restricting rhetoric or actions that inform aggregated community, um, the aggregated community of their rights, obligations, and privileges. And it's not always, um, you know, it's not always easy <laughs> to, to see what that application looks like um, from the outside. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about enclosure and improvement, which is, I promise it's related. Um, enclosure is a, a capitalist project that starts in England really early on, like 13th century early on. Um, but basically it, it's broken down into how um, subsistence farming and like communal uses of spaces to ensure that a community has enough food to eat and that, that they can pay their taxes and uh, you know it was essentially a feudal system. Um, Enclosure is something that the, the a government body comes up with to basically make sure that those communal spaces that are used for agriculture are separated um, and then commoditized. Uh, so individuals would have to produce a, a specific set of um, like agricultural products to, for themselves and then to bring to market. So they could no longer create or, uh, you know, raise everything that they needed necessarily. They needed to raise and uh, cultivate things for the market and then pay themselves back. And they do this, <laughs> they practice this at first, um, like within the heart of England and then within its periphery and then they kind of apply it uh, to the outside. So we'll talk about that a little bit. Um, Victorian values are a cultural list of best practices that center on Christian Protestant and capitalist methods and values, which is, again, like a very English holdover um, that was kind of imported into the U.S. Uh, during the 19th century. Excuse me. Um, this creates a denial of economic choices and commits or overt violence against some ethnic groups. Um, which were not identified by groups themselves, but applied by the outside force like we already talked about. Um, examples of Victorian values would be like the temperance mover, movement or outwards expression of social hierarchy by material goods. So we'll get into a little bit of that. Um, material culture for anyone that isn't familiar is a residue or material by a product or as a function of human utilization of their environment or to create and impact their surroundings. It includes anything made by human hands or altered by human hands. Um, you know, the, the nuts and bolts of what archaeology uses to understand the world. Um, and then symbolic and overt violence. Uh, these are two sp specific terms that uh, Charles Orser plays or, or has explained quite a few times in the last 20 years or so. Um, and I've used a lot of his work in my work. Um, symbolic, uh, symbolic violence are actions taken by an oppressing force to culturally impact a victim or group of victims to achieve a desired result without physically displacing or harming them directly 
Um, often symbolic violence can be understood as actions which appear to be achieving a benign goal but are actually stripping rights and privileges from the disadvantaged group. A good example is focusing on a particular material or item restriction and cultural impl implications of that restriction. So if you're only allowed to keep one type of thing in your life, but you previously created that thing in a different, uh, different way yourself, then symbolic violence is committed against you and forcing to give up that co the cultural portion of the creation of that thing, even though it, it may not be perceived that way. Um, overt violence is, you know, your run of the mill, uh, racialized violence. Um, and it's pretty easy to see on its face. Uh, so we'll talk about uh, enclosure in the capitalist chef for a second. So like I was saying, um, really this is an agricultural uh, shift in policy, but what it ends up doing is it creates a culture of um, monocrop or capitalistic farming and it and in uh, some arenas where this was applied, it basically sets off all the dominoes for something to happen like the Irish famine um, is essentially that there was an entire uh, group of agricultural practicing peoples that were forced into um, monocrop farming by this new system. And then that monocrop farming led to, uh, you know, a lack of biodiversity and, and a... Uh, um, the weakness in their system of life. So they ended up having this tra tragedy, which actually comes back and plays into some of uh, the British government's basic needs in having to deal with, uh, you know, uh, undesirable populations. And we'll talk about that in a second too. Um, and that, that brings us to labor in the British empire. And then they were actually pretty, um, I guess, opportunistic in the way that they found their uh, labor populations throughout their history and how they applied them to the colonies that they held. Um, so it really began with prisoners of war, uh, anybody that they necessarily fought with, especially during the 17th century, they just kind of, whoever lost, they stuck them on a boat and sent them here um, and put them to work in iron mines in Massachusetts or or I guess New England, not necessarily Massachusetts, um, or, you know, uh, large scale agriculture in Virginia, that kind of thing. Um, and then they would move on to poor and undesirable populations. So they would just lift poor people off the street, um, essentially because they were uh, undesirable for the aesthetic of what the British Empire was supposed to be. Um, so they would just lift these people up and kind of ship them off to provide labor um, for colonies. And uh, then you have prisoners and criminals. Uh, they kind of ship them off as well. And then in the backdrop of all of this, there's, there's the African slave trade, which, um, you know, I, I'm not really going to get into a lot of that, that stuff because um, it's all in their ball wax. Um, but you know, it, it's important to keep it in mind because it does um, obviously have a bearing on these cycles of racialization and dehumanization of populations. Um, so what happens when they get to the US? Victorian values and religious contention really frame a lot of what happens to Irish populations, especially in um, northeastern cities like New York, Philadelphia, and Boston, um, Quebec City, to, to a lower degree, Montreal. Um, ultimately, what happens there is not necessarily, they are dehumanized for uh, the base level of just being Irish when everyone else isn't supposed to be. Um, but it, mostly it comes down to them being uh, Catholic, uh, and there's a real... Uh, cultural divide that is based on religion uh, in addition to what would be like the racialized population of who the, the Irish people were, um, especially in 19th century uh, New York City. Um, so these two images are a good, <laughs> are a good uh, indication of what that 
like the cultural ideal would be is on the left. Um, you know, and what I think is interesting about uh, that image is there's a lot of like flowers, there's a, a you know, uh, very much an organized home life with entertainment and that kind of thing. Um, and then on the right, you have the, which is the same <laughs> contemporaneous time period that you're talking about is, um, that is a, uh, an image of papists in the American River Ganges attacking children who uh, were, you know, subjected to the viability of teaching Catholic kids uh, in addition to Protestant kids in the public school system. And you can see in the back of that image, the, the building that is uh, dilapidated with the flag upside down says US public schools. Um, this is direct, directly related to uh, a Protestant versus Catholic political sphere clash in New York City at the time, uh, which eventually ended in the McClay Act uh, in 1842, which made it legal for uh, basically, it set up everything for a secular public school system, which uh, before that was really based on uh, religious uh, school systems um, and Catholic schools were uh, selected against by the majority of the ruling classes in New York City at the time. Um, and the reason for this is that there was an indoctrination as a, a there, there was an indoctrination of this idea that um, any Catholicism, especially Irish Catholicism, was supporting a, a foreign sovereignty um, in what was the new American Republic where, uh, you know, anything that was a sovereign was uh, basically against uh, the cultural values at the time. Um, obviously, the Pope isn't gonna, uh, you know, create some kind of empire in the US uh, through uh, Catholic populations, especially uh, educating children. But this was the kind of, um, you know, promotional material or, uh, you know, propaganda of the time period. Um, and there was an absolute distrust of, of any kind of absolute monarchy, but they, they use this as kind of a crutch to, to you know, uh, select against these people and, and, um, and we keep, uh, essential services away from them. So that creates, it highlights a legacy of racialization and what has turned out to be unfortunately a lasting corruption of the country. Um, so these three images are really telling. The, the first one on the right, we'll go right to left, is, and this is a Harper's Weekly, um, which is a great political cartoon uh, from this time period to kind of mine for these type of images and, and get a, a good uh, you know, pulse for what the country was thinking or arguing about at the time. And essentially what it's, it's a, a simianized uh, Irish, um, you know, typical Patty as they would say, um, and he's of equal value to who, who is Af you know, an African-American slave basically. And then he's white and um, on the left, the guy's black, north and south, and they're making an, equa like an equation. Um, in the middle, you have that same, <laughs> that, that same image in the back, you have, uh, you know, a colored orphanage and you can see there are nooses hanging in that tree back there. But even though um, the men who were uh, portraying that violence in this image are Irish, they're still simianized in this image, which is important because it's saying that, you know, they are, they are asserting violence against another racialized group in order to try to create uh, political capital for themselves. Um, but it, it, isn't, it isn't actually perceived that way by the people who are actually in political power. Um, and the most recent development in the middle image is that um, there's a Chinese immigrant on the floor who uh, liberty is comforting. And the, the title of this image is called The Chinese Question. So it was during 
um, you know, the railroad boom era, there were a lot of Chinese immigrants coming through California and some from New York. Um, and, you know, you have this angry mob of everyone who has kind of been in part of the system already looking for like their new victim, right? And that plays into achieving whiteness um, in the United States during this time period and how there's an, uh, an, adv an advantageous position or at least perceived as one during the 19th century in uh, racializing another group to make sure that your group isn't racialized anymore. And on the left, you can see that that's this, this is a, the title of that image is called a white man's government, or this is a white man's government. And of course you have uh, Davis in the middle with a CSA uh, belt buckle. And then on the right, um, I can't, I can't remember who that is. It might be a governor. And on the left, uh, that's a, a simianized Irish immigrant um, holding a shillelagh and they're all standing on top of uh, an African-American because um, at least they're all equal above them, or at least that's how they perceived their status at the time. Um, so that kind of it highlights this uh, cycle of racialization by existing immigrant populations in the United States with the exception of Native and African-Americans um, who, who never, <laughs> They never got, they never were part of this system. They were always um, ostracized and isolated from the start. So how do we talk about if, if ethnicity is really difficult to assign because you can't assign it and identity is really difficult to assign because it's self assigning, then how do you talk about, you know, groups of people and archeological archeolo uh, interpretations and that's a, that's a really difficult question to answer. And really what you have to do is you have to use uh, material indications of racialized, these racialized actions to kind of interpret what historical agents were considering um, difference and then meld that with historical documentation and actions of resistance that end up creating material records as well. And what you get is kind of a blurry picture of there are some individuals who are doing uh, X material creating thing that makes it so you can see an identity and then you have an X number of uh, individuals assigning an identity to a group of people even though they might not want or identify that way. And then it, you have a, a separate group of individuals who are writing about that thing with their own biases. Um, so it, it's all pretty murky and it only gets worse when you don't have uh, material indications with great enough variability to, to even support any kind of interpretation that nears towards an understanding of what that is. And um, that's really where my research has come in into evaluating what that variability level is and what kind of questions that you can answer with archaeological data at what point. Um, sorry. So what's important to understand is that during this time period, the frontier in, I think a lot of people think of the frontier as like the Wild West. Um, the frontier in 1840 was the St. Louis River, um, or St. Louis. You know, anything past that is like no man's land. Nobody even knows what's going on over there. And you certainly wouldn't go there without an escort. Um, and, you know, Dickens in 1842 writes uh, American Notes for General Circulation, where he and reluctantly his wife uh, go on this tour of the U.S. and they kind of make their way through Massachusetts after landing there and they get to Pennsylvania and it takes them five days to get across Pennsylvania because um, he wanted to do an overland route instead of taking the Erie Canal, which would have saved him time, <laughs> um, which she wasn't super happy about. And when they finally do get um, to Pittsburgh, they have to ask around uh, about what steamship hasn't blown up in a while so that they can take that and make their way. <laughs> 
Um, and, and that kind of environment is what we're dealing with at the beginning of the 19th century where you, um, it, it's really hard to get goods and services and people anywhere, um, especially before uh, the widespread installation of railroad lines. Um, so that, I guess, material variability along what the frontier is, is really uh, kind of pockets of individual areas where you might have really good access to some things, but not other things. And your trade routes might not be exactly what you think they are. And there might be antagonisms from, um, you know, other political entities in the area, especially as you edge towards Canada and things like that, um, where you create these kind of hinterland regions that are really pretty disconnected from the world, uh, the world uh, trade network and the centers of political power. So in order to fix that, a lot of industrialists at the beginning of the 19th century and, polit uh, and politicians end up doing like big arterial constructions to try to, um, you know, connect some of these smaller uh, hinterland regions. And the Erie Canal is one of, one of those projects. Um, and after that canal and the CNO canal kind of get their start, and of course the Erie Canal was finished first, um, the invention and widespread uh, dissemination of railroad corridors kind of allowed this to happen by the end of the 19th century. Um, but the economic and cultural implications of that lack of access continues all the way through the 19th century because in some places they don't have a reliable railroad line until 1880 uh, and sometimes eight, and sometimes later than that. Um, so you know your material indications of what could be perceived as high value or um, you know so, uh, socioeconomically prestigious might be very different in a hinterland region where they haven't been able to have the variability of goods that say like the Hudson River enjoys uh, you know much earlier on at the beginning of the 19th or end of the 18th century. So where does, so how does this construction happen, the arterial construction? Um, mostly it's businessmen and politicians and they kind of, uh, you know, they've made a priority out of connecting uh, the Atlantic Ocean and the West via the Great Lakes. And so that's where the Erie Canal kind of shows up and it's where the CNO canal shows up too. Um, and of course the, the Erie Canal is, is finished in 1826 to, to achieve that goal. But in order to do that, um, they had to have the labor come from somewhere to, to build it. And uh, you know, it was dug mostly with, with shovels, um, which is, is quite a feat. But it was basically subcontracted out from the state um, and the state of New York and the federal government supplied a lot of money to contractors to, uh, to dig the Erie Canal. And then those people employed uh, agricultural labor really from throughout the Northeast uh, in off seasons to come and, and do that. And they were predominantly immigrants, which is not a surprise. Um, and in many cases, they didn't pay them. They would uh, promise to, and then after they would work for a month, they'd you know, make sure that they were fed and, and whatever, and then uh, they didn't pay them then either. And then eventually that, that uh, you know, contractor disappeared and they got a new one and, and that kind of thing um, happened over and over and over again until it was finished. The interesting thing is, is that happens again with the railroad industry and really the New York railroad system. And the money that uh, built the New York Railroad system in many cases through some of these uh, smaller kind of hinterland regions that we're talking about was supplied by the communities themselves. And uh, there's a great book, um, I think it's Pierce is the author, that uh, 
it outlines exactly how much money came from what community to connect to what railroad system and how long that railroad system ran for. And in some cases, uh, small hamlets in upstate New York were paying um, enormous sums of money for a railroad line to be connected to their community so that they could get uh, logging materials and um, you know, kind of resource extraction or like this here uh, from Shinhopal about bluestone stone docks um, out to market to get them to New York City or uh, to Philadelphia or wherever. Um, and then they in turn would get, you know, all of those kind of commodity items that they've been unable to get for years and years and years at uh, a decent cost. It's not that you couldn't order something through a general store, but it'd be so prohibitively expensive that you wouldn't do that. Um, and then the labor to run, to build and run those lines uh, comes from, you know, name your immigrant group. They've, they've all worked on it uh, in, in, in horrible conditions, um, which is the point. And their impact in, on rural communities in New York State specifically, and how they were treated both during uh, the Erie Canal uh, construction and the railroad construction, shows exactly that um, that cycle of racial, racialization that we're talking about. Is that you'd have, um, you know, these farmhands come up to dig in a ditch for a season, and they would be completely ostracized by the communities that that canal or that railroad was going to be servicing. Um, sorry, just one second. So what is the visibility of that cultural exclusion? Um, that's a really hard question to answer, uh, like we were saying. So. How do, you, how do you look at some of that stuff? And really it's about access to market um, and inequality. And without uh, material variability in a specific small community, like if everyone has the same access to the same sets of ceramics or the same access to sugar or, um, you know, like some really, uh, interesting items that uh, Albany would have access to, for example, that you wouldn't see in order books um, that are down the Mohawk or Delaware rivers is like parasols uh, or fine linens or, or even just pre-made clothing um, is something that shows up in day books in uh, metropolitan areas along the Hudson River that you don't get anywhere else in New York during the same time period. And that's because um, you know, the longer something goes down the trade line, the more expensive it is to get to wherever it's going. And, uh, you know, the, the closer you are to a major arterial construction, like the Erie Canal, uh, as it follows the Mohawk River or the Hudson River, the easier it is for you to do that. Um, this log raft uh, image is a really great uh, example of how you might not think something is the way that it actually ended up being in history. And um, this is in uh, the East Branch of the Delaware River, which is kind of uh, just Northeast is Pennsylvania, where uh, New York State takes a downturn. Um, and before the Delaware River enters Pennsylvania. And it's part of the Hardenburg Purchase. And you would think that uh, they're pretty close to the Hudson River. Like it, it, it pretty close. I mean, it's, it's 60, 70 miles of mountain pass, basically, before you get to some flatland and can make your way. Uh, but these folks, um, they were in the business of timbering. So they would construct log rafts and float them down the Delaware all the way to Philadelphia, and then buy whatever they needed, and then uh, get a boat back up the Delaware from Philadelphia. So even though going to some place like uh, New York City or even just like the New York uh, metro area around there uh, would seem like the, the clear choice. They went further because it, it happened to be easier <laughs> for them to do so. And I, I think that those, uh, those trade routes are interesting 
uh, that they show up that way. It happens again with the Adirondacks um, with uh, kind of expediency and efficacy over, uh, you know, physical distance or even established, you know, post roads and things like that. Um, and it really speaks to how different the archaeological assemblages are in some of these hinterland regions that you might expect them to be, and you have to evaluate, um, you know, every kind of avenue of, of how those people got, what materials that they're looking at, and, and from where, um, and how that informs what you can say confidently about cultural identification or, or even just, uh, uh, you know, the application of an ID by an outside force in the same area. It's, it's really difficult to see that kind of difference in contexts where you don't have the variability to, to substantiate that difference. Um, so in order to do this, it's not like I went out and, and you know, excavated 100 sites across New York State. That's, that's crazy. Um, there's a ton of available data that is aggregated every day from CRM firms from across the state and from uh, academic, uh, University of Buffalo, uh, SUNY Binghamton, uh, Albany, all the, you know, the, the major um, research, uh, research institutions in New York State all um, send that data somewhere at the end of the day, eventually, um, and it makes its way to the New York State Museum or uh, New York State uh, Office of Parks and Historic Preservation. Um, it also ends up in the New York State Archive in Albany or um, the Historical Association Library in Cooperstown. And they're more than happy to provide all of this data so that you can evaluate, um, you know, big trends like this and limitations of what interpretations might be on a large scale um, utilizing some of this stuff. And so that's what I did. I, I looked at you know, over a dozen sites from across the, the state um, using these different systems. And the, the same goes with the documentary evidence and general store day books from uh, various counties that were uh, contemporaneous with the archaeological sites that we're talking about so that you get a good idea of like what your market basket of available goods would be. And then um, what you're seeing people actually consuming at the sites that are adjacent to those <laughs> general stores um, that they would have been frequenting at. And you can find uh, interesting stuff in these day books to, to kind of harken back to the use of the area um, and the interrelationship between communities. Uh, there was one day book from, I think, Franklin, New York, that uh, highlighted this uh, there was a woman there, a widow, who um, once a month paid the general store to close uh, all day and take her on a horse to Oneonta because it was uh, the closest thing to the Susquehanna River and then she could buy what she needed and, and uh, see whoever she needed to see and then she got, uh, you know, carted back over um, the mountain to Franklin the next day and even though that's only, you know, 25 miles at the time, 25 miles is a lot when there's no um, reliable transportation to, to have yourself um, for, for that kind of uh, environment. So it's significant for the archaeological community because the 19th century is kind of taken for granted as a, a period of, we, you know, we have thousands of these kind of 19th century farmstead sort of things, but there's really a lot of economic development still happening in the country and variability in that development, even within a subregion of a certain state that you would consider, you know, well within the, uh, the confines of what could be considered the established country at the time. Um, and it's something that we've seen in uh, like I said, Chris Fennell's work in Virginia, it's something that I've seen in New York, and, and I'm sure that it, it replicates itself, uh, you know, further into New England, um, especially in a place like Vermont, I'm sure would see a very similar, uh, you know, highlight of this access to market problem and how it impacts 
uh, archaeological interpretations and collections from sites that you know many people would write off. Um, the use of site collections by repos repositories is, uh, is super important and there's a lot of data left out there that has been done by uh, like the public archaeological facility in SUNY Binghamton or CRSP which is um, you know, the New York State Museum CRM arm uh, that has a lot of these, has a lot of opportunities to, to answer some of these questions. Um, that said, the, the question that I've not been able to answer with this is that uh, ethnic ass assignment using the archaeological record is, is uh, incredibly difficult. Um, and it, it's, not, it's not feasible. <laughs> Uh, to do that um, without, you know, a written document by the the household leader that you're looking at um, saying, like, I identify as X, uh, you know, and even if you want to isolate the treatment of a certain group of people, uh, you need established variability in, in material culture to do that. Um, and that's all couched in these larger, uh, you know, changes in uh, available uh, market. Um, there are clear indications of economic availability difference, uh, specifically with New York State, like I said, but it, it could certainly apply to, to any um, adjacent subregion. Um, the economic av availability differences can implicate material culture signatures of disenfranchised groups, but only in situations that uh, that allow it to happen. You know, there's a I I I, uh, I focus a lot on consumption of individual items and small finds and things like that, but there's also uh, symbolic um, or I'm sorry, not symbolic, systemic. Uh, community services lines that are, uh, you know, catered to these uh, racialized attitudes by uh, historical agents. And uh, an example comes to mind from California, actually, where um, there's a large group of Chinese immigrants who have uh, kind of isolated, um, have been isolated, and, um, you know, much of the surrounding community gets uh, water lines installed to facilitate firefighting um, and their community does not and it's very much on purpose to do that and uh, archaeologically speaking looking at that without the benefit of any other material culture you have a community where th the entirety of that community is laid in with water lines for uh, fire hydrants and then you have one section of the community that isn't and that kind of pattern lends itself to asking the question of why that is and what kind of uh, cultural implication does that, does that tell you. Um, and in combination with documentary evidence and, uh, you know, descendant groups and ethno-historical accounts and things like that, it, it's very clear that it was a racialized action to do that um, and slight against those people uh, in order to, to, you know, essentially make them less safe. Um, and that really brings it to the last two points, which is that material cultural signatures are not evidence enough to make cultural assumptions or uh, ethnic identifications based on archaeological interpretation alone. And I think that's a really important point to take from this or, or uh, from the book, if you read it, is that it's, it's, a, it's not, a, archaeological material is not an, a reason to make that assumption um, on its own, and that uh, the construction and continuation of systemic and symbolic and overt violence require uh, economic difference and societal bias. And, you know, really that comes down to why does this matter to people today? Uh, like, why are we talking about this? And it's really, um, this hasn't gotten better, right? Um, it's just different people being exploited uh, for the most part with the exception of uh, Native and African Americans. Um, and, you know, I, I, I break down a little bit uh, in the preface about 
there are five core needs, or at least I theorize that there are, um, for a culture to express itself and create and foster identity and art. Um, and in order to do all of that, they need food, water, shelter, medical assistance, and safety. And without any of those five things, they can't go on to actualize um, without being under duress. Like, and, um, you know, if one of those things is threatened by an outside force, then whatever uh, it is created it is going to be influenced by, um, you know, their entire environment. Um, and th that's important to realize because, you know, no population, however they identify, will be able to thrive if they're under duress by the population that's surrounding them um, and that they're a part of. And I think that's really important to understand because the, the cycle of racialization that's happened to uh, these groups that we've talked about is continuing to happen all the time, um, you know, with Latin communities or, uh, you know, Muslim communities or, you know, take your pick. There's a, a there's a, a vignette in there about, in the book about, uh, you know, a Catholic Italian immigrant at the end of the 19th century is not different in the way that they're treated than a Syrian refugee was or is currently. And that's something that we need to highlight and understand about our current culture, um, that this hasn't gotten better. It's just changed um, on its face. And the more effort we make to understand how this stuff kind of uh, creates and perpetualizes itself, um, we have a better chance of kind of disarming it and, and slowing it down or walking it back a little bit. And, uh, you know, it has lasting effects on diplomacy and national identity and technological and economic development, or even as we've seen this year, <laughs> you know, medical assistance being one of those five things, it's, it's been super um, important and has been highlighted by the events of this year where whole communities have been ignored or, uh, you know, kind of testing functions and things like that. I mean, the, the pandemic as we've seen it has affected uh, disenfranchised or disadvantaged populations more than anyone else. And, and that's because of this problem. So that's kind of the end. Um, be glad to take questions if anyone has any. Yes, um, if you have questions, you can put it in the chat function and um, I'll relay them. Um, but if I can start, I always ask all of our speakers this, um, what got you into this uh, topic? What sort of, you know, hooked you or was it just, you know, part of a job, a collection, you know? Sure. I, I started, I did my master's on the Five Points neighborhood in New York City, and um, I didn't really know what I was going to get into with that. I, you know, I, I looked at a lot of ironstone <laughs> pottery, basically. Um, but I saw this uh, really interesting um, relationship between uh, African American populations and Irish populations and German populations and uh, Jewish populations in New York City and how the, those people were treated by, um, you know, the, the political entities in power there. And it, it kind of got me thinking about there must be a larger trend to this and, and how far back can we trace it and, and that kind of thing. And, uh, you know, it really, it, it goes back to this connection between, um, you know, a British identity and empire and things like that, you know, further back in time and how that kind of mutates with uh, what American identities are. Oh, very cool. Yeah, no, um, I'm just trying to think, because you, you do New York, um, do you know of any similar studies from like Boston or? I haven't read anything from Boston specifically um, outside of, there's a couple of small uh, case studies from downtown Boston that folks have done specific projects on that have really drilled down into like the tenement housing kind of stuff, um, which is all related, right? But I haven't seen anything uh, 
recently that's been more uh, systematic or broader in scope, I'd love to, to, to hear if somebody has, that'd be great. You know, yeah, I'm trying to think now, some of the like other cities and stuff like that, you, I think you might be like the first, so um, that's pretty big. Um, do we have any other questions? I don't think we do. This was so cool, so fascinating. Now I'm like, I know for me, I don't, you know, don't know about everyone else, but now I am. I'm thinking um, of, you know, Boston or even Savannah, you know, other popu other places. I know there was large immigrant populations. Yeah, for sure. Savannah's a great candidate. Yeah. Oh, so we have another one. Uh, did you, do you find this is more that, let me reread. Do you find this is more than British imperial, um, such as Spanish or Portuguese empire? Absolutely. I'm sure that it does absolutely apply in Mesoamerican and South American contexts, or even, uh, you know, the Gulf uh, being part of the Spanish empire and that kind of thing. Um, I, it's just outside of the, the scope of what I've looked at over the last few years, but um, it, it wouldn't surprise me. <laughs> Um, another question is, did you establish a firm date range for your study or did you just let the collections sort of guide your time periods? Um, it was really uh, defined by what I could um, look at contemporaneously between the collections and the documentation. So I only used sites that I had both lines of evidence for um, to really uh, evaluate that and kind of peppered in between with sites that are related or in related contexts that, that might apply. Um, but I didn't start out with, you know, I'm going to look at 1800 to 1900. It was very much, uh, you know, it ended up being kind of post-revolution to the First World War, um, you know, even a little bit after that. But it's... Uh, so it's sort of like the long 19th century kind of yeah, thing. Exactly, yeah. Right? A little before, a little after. Um, well, those, those folks did tend to live quite a long time so you know yep um another question just came in could you please elaborate on your view that ethnicities are difficult to interpret from artifact collections alone what about particular objects that convey ethnicity such as a catholic medal or cross sure um so that's a great question um a catholic cross is a good indication of uh, a religious, you know, occupation of a site that you might be investigating. But I'm reminded of a uh, context where you have those objects um, in a sarcastic uh, objective. So that there was a uh, there was a teapot set that it might have been a Father Matthew cup something like that. Um, but it was basically used uh, to relieve themselves in the morning uh, as a way of, of disrespect to, you know, the opposing view of what they were currently holding. And the only reason that they knew that was by doing residue analysis on uh, the, the cup in question. So it's, um, at least I think that's, that's how that study went. But what I mean is, is that people aren't necessarily logical in all of their actions, and it's really difficult to kind of ascribe an assumption for specific materials in specific contexts um, to talk about identity. And also, uh, you know, in a larger kind of more systemic um, complication to that is just because someone has a crucifix doesn't necessarily mean that they're still practicing, or um, if they would, uh, you know, culturally identify as part of a group that would hold that in a certain way or if they're interpreting it in a different way um, or if it was given to them it could have been uh, you know I, I've seen uh, sites I worked on a site actually that had a Jesuit cross but it was in a, an, an African American uh, uh, slave context in a builder's trench uh, for a Dutch house that that had slaves um, and so it was likely you know kind of a, a, a missionary uh, sort of object given to, to folks that were being 
converted at the time. And so, you know, you can't necessarily ascribe that kind of identity just because of an object, especially a small find like that. Sort of, I think, connects to the last question we have for tonight is, uh, do you find the material culture more related than to the economic status, perhaps, rather than ethnic identity? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, that really comes down to this kind of nuanced variability in what is and what isn't available. Um, you know, we shouldn't assume that ever just because, you know, something has an, a, an initial uh, production date of 1863 doesn't mean that, you know, uh, Chautauqua County, New York has that thing in 1864. It's probably not that way. Um, and even assumptions about uh, the, the availability of a good like that um, need to be drawn out even more than they have for what I've seen in my research is that many people just aren't utilizing stuff like that unless um, there's like a whole community effort to do so. Okay, well, thank you for talking with us tonight. Uh, this was really exciting. And thank you to everyone who joined us. Um, you can join the MAS uh, chapter's January lecture next year, kicking off 2021, I believe it's with Calvin Myers uh, doing underwater archeology, span I believe. Um, uh, so, yeah. I was gonna tell you, yeah, it's, it has to do with the the Portland shipwreck in Stowag and Bank, the research that they've been doing in, with three-dimensional mapping and documentation. So uh, hopefully it'll be another exciting one too, you know, the underwater stuff is, uh, is close to my heart, but <laughs> well, this is great. Um, Jordan, really thank you. Uh, kind of brings back some of the roots of places I did field work, so I was kind of happy. <laughs> Yes, and everyone remember, you can go out and get his book. So, you know, maybe put it on a Christmas list or something. I'm sure Amazon Prime can get it to you in time. They can. They, they <laughs> <can try me. laughs> so, well, again, thank you, Jordan. Thank you, everyone else. Um, and we'll let you all go. Have a good night. Yeah, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Stay well and stay healthy. Yes, you too. Bye-bye.